coming back to Schwarzschild space time, the key thing is what we mean by duration is only relative to the sorts of paths that massive bodies can follow. But the interior of a black hole is such that there is no path out. There's no way to get out of it. There's no path that can take you that like a- along which this kind of measurement could be made, which ends up having the, the, the consequence that regions in the ex, like the exterior regions of black holes, like places outside of black holes are, are not before or after. Or there are some that are before, I guess, but th- there aren't, there aren't like locations outside of the black hole that are, you know, after any region inside the black hole. You get this kind of radical disconnection between the interior of the black hole and the stuff, the stuff outside for this reason. Hello, this is Robinson Earhart here with the introduction to Robinson's podcast number 161. And this episode is with James Owen Weatherall, who is professor of logic and the philosophy of science and department chair at the University of California, Irvine. So Jim is a physicist. He's a mathematician. He's a philosopher. And he also has an MFA, which can't be forgotten, in which we talk about. And he works broadly on the mathematical and conceptual foundations of classical and quantum field theories, as well as on the philosophy of science more generally, though he has plenty of other interests, such as the finance of Wall Street. But in this episode, Jim and I uh, restrict our discussion to nothing, uh, more particularly to nothingness and the void. And we start off by discussing whether this is a problem for metaphysics or physics and how these two are even related. And then we get into the classic debate between Leibniz and Newton, mediated through Samuel Clark on the nature of space, Einstein's special and general relativity, and how space was given a sophisticated geometrical background that changed what it could mean for space to be empty. And then we end with the low energy quantum vacuum state and the seething nothingness it instantiates. So, Much of our conversation revolves around one of Jim's books, which is Void, The Strange Physics of Nothing. And you can find a link to that in in the description. Likes, comments, subscribes, always helpful. And now, without any further ado, I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I enjoyed having it with Jim. As I was reading Void, I I kept thinking to myself, man, this guy can write. <laughs> and so we'll, we'll, we'll get to quantum field theory, but I mean, you introduced Paul Dirac almost like a novelist might. And then when I started preparing for our conversation, I saw that you actually got, in addition to PhDs in, in physics and philosophy, an MFA where you had two theses, I, I think I've been wrong before in my uh, preparation, but one creative and, and one technical. So, I mean, before we even get to void and nothingness, how did the MFA fit into your training? Where does it fit into physics and philosophy? Well, I mean, it doesn't really fit into physics and philosophy, but the MFA is the first thing I did coming out of uh, undergrad. Um, you know, I, when I when I was in high school, I wanted to be a writer. When I was in college, I did physics and philosophy, and then I thought I'm going to go back to to creative writing and I started this MFA and then sort of, you know, other things happened. Um, but I did eventually finish the MFA and, uh, the, um, I mean, it, it was the MFA that I would say most directly led to the first book that I did, which was the physics of wall street, which I wrote while I was a, a grad student in, in philosophy. Why did the MFA lead to that one? Um, kind of for, professional reasons. I mean, it, it was my my mentor in the MFA program who put me in touch with his former agent who um, then sort of, you know, hel- helped me with some magazine articles that I was doing. And and uh, those magazine articles were kind of what led to, to that book. Um, I mean, I think, I think of it as a, a quite philosophical book in many ways. I mean, it's really, it's written for a general audience. It's very much a trade book. 
Um, but, uh, it's, it's ultimately about like modeling methodology and, and how to think about like how models represent the world and the limitations of modeling, which I think is just a core topic in philosophy of science, but applied to the 2007, 2008 financial crisis and sort of policy from then on. Um, but yeah, no, it, it, that, that came out of, uh, like doing some, I don't want to say creative nonfiction, but, but, you know, magazine writing, popular writing for magazines that, that, um, was at least partly related to the MFA. Okay. Well, I, I have to admit that I was disappointed because I was hoping that being the only philosopher slash physicist slash, uh, MFA professor, I mean, possessor in the, in the field was part of some master plan, but no, that's still awesome. <laughs> just <laughs> opportunism and, and, um, uh, just like, yeah, just sort of bumping my way through a dark hallway. Got it. Well, I mean, it still clearly paid out. But then as we move on and then turn to void and emptiness, I think there are, there are two immediate questions that come to mind uh, in in this topic. And one is, why is there something rather than nothing? And then the other is, what is nothingness in so much uh, as it's possible, what it, what is it what is it like? But rather than try to answer these questions right off the bat, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about how one should just go about thinking about them. Are they fodder for philosophers for metaphysics, or do you think the questions fall more squarely in the camp of the physicists? Yeah. So I don't usually draw a sharp distinction between metaphysics and, and physics. Um, I, I think it's certainly true that if you just, you know, look at the professional activity, there are a lot of things that, that metaphysicians do and a lot of things that physicists do don't have very much in common with one another. Um, but there is a, a, a clear shared project of trying to understand what the structure of the world is. Um, and in, to some extent there are, uh, overlapping methods. Um, it seems to me, though, that as a physicist, uh, it's very difficult to get out of the business of doing some metaphysics. Now, it's not always done consciously, and often there are sort of things that you take off the shelf uh, and just take for granted. Um, but there, there are a lot of assumptions that go into the physical theories that we use. Um, a lot of things that we've learned about how the world must be. Um, that didn't even occur to metaphysicians prior to the advent of, of certain physical theories. Um, a lot of work in the conceptual foundations of those theories that's clarified those metaphys metaphysical presuppositions. Um, and so I, I don't really think that you can, can do physics without a substantial amount of metaphysics in, in the background. Um, now, I mean, it's kind of a, a methodological stance within metaphysics, but I, I also tend to think that the most interesting, compelling metaphysics is uh, very much informed by the ways in which metaphysics does relate to physics, the kinds of things that that are compatible with our physical theorizing that are needed for our physical theorizing um, seem to me to be the the right starting point for um, for doing metaphysics. Hmm. Yeah. So uh, I mean, you started off by saying that you you can draw much of a distinction between physics, or you don't draw much of a distinction between metaphysics and physics. And this reminds me very much of something that Tim Modlin says, or has said to me a number of times, just that if you're interested in the metaphysics of the world, that's what physics is about. So you need to be very well informed of physics if you want to be doing the physics, metaphysics of the world. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's essentially right. The thing that, that I would... Uh, like and the only place I would quibble is that I think that physics is actually about physics and metaphysics like is presupposed by physics. It's, it's uh, there's a lot of metaphysics that is um, happening within physics. I mean, Tim has a book, the metaphysics within physics, right? I mean, I think, I think that there's a lot of metaphysics within physics. Um, I mean, I, I do think that there, there uh, are questions that physicists just don't, don't answer. Um, they're not particularly well trained to answer. They aren't always interested in answering. It's continuous with the work that they're doing. Um, but, 
uh, does, does, you know, extend it in directions that they're not particularly inclined to go. So, I, I mean, I think there's work for us to do. Mm -hmm. But now with regard to void and your own particular work as a philosopher of physics, am I right that you're less interested in what would at least be more conventionally considered the metaphysical or modal question, why is there something rather than nothing? And more in the question, how physics should inform the way we conceive of what is or what's going on in empty space. And maybe that this is something we need to better understand if we want to know what's going on in, in the world of stuff. Yeah. I mean, so the way that I would think about it, is that uh, there's a version of the question, why is there something rather than nothing, that uh, is really un underspecified. I mean, it, it, it's, it's not clear what you're allowed to, to, to start with, what you're allowed to take for granted in addressing this question. And sort of, you know, why is there anything at all as opposed to nothing at all? Like, how do we even, how do we even think about these as possible alternatives? Like, I think that in order to get traction on this kind of question, um, you need to, to have some understanding of what we mean by something and what we mean by nothing. One of the things I try to argue in the book is that, you know, it is pretty clear for a kind of naturalized metaphysician where you would go to get an understanding of what we mean by something because our physical theories are, you know, doing precisely that. They're telling us what kinds of things there are in the world, how they work. Um, but it turns out that our physical theories are also providing us with accounts of what the world would be like if there weren't any stuff. Um, now, I, I totally can see that the kinds of answers that we can give once we've moved into uh, uh this kind of like, you know, naturalized version of the question where you, you know, think about something and nothing within a particular physical theory. And then maybe you're asking a dynamical question. You're asking a question about, um, why this state rather than that state, which is also, you know, represented within the theory. Um, you are not addressing what you might have thought of as the question you started with. Um, but you're, you're addressing a question that is, um, I, I think kind of better formed, uh, one, one that you have a, a chance of answering. I think answers to that question end up kind of revealing why the original question was maybe less interesting than you thought it was or less, less clear in its conception than you thought it was. Um, and yeah, so, uh, you know, kind of acknowledging that we aren't answering the question that we started with. I think that the question that we do end up being able to answer is in, in some sense, the more fruitful one. I mean, there's another step in the argument in the book, of course, which is uh, actually we can't answer that question once and for all, because it turns out that what we mean by something, and what we mean by nothing is, is strongly theory dependent. And we can see this kind of uh, really fascinating change over the history of science and how we come to understand both something and nothingness within the context of different physical theories. Now, I use that observation to feed back on, on how to understand the original question, because there's some sense in which the original question isn't entirely devoid of um, uh, assumptions about what it would mean for there to be something and what it would mean for there to be nothing, ones that are kind of grounded in a you know pre-theoretical conception of what the physical world is like. And so there's some sense, I want to say, in which actually the original question, although not answered by the kind of more naturalized versions of the question, should be seen as, as itself embedded within a broader theoretical context that's been superseded by the physical theorizing that we've done since. So, I mean, I, I do have kind of more to say about uh, why I don't like the original question, even though I acknowledge that I'm not answering it. Mm -hmm. With regard to this original question, though, that you don't like, and how do we even think about there being nothing or anything at all as alternatives? This seems to me, to, though, to point to philosophy or metaphysics as the battleground for this question, and so much as historically, at least, 
Our room today, too, I mean, philosophy is often the place that questions find themselves when there's no agreed upon methodology for solving them. How do we even go about it? Then once there's an agreed upon methodology, maybe it gets dealt out to the special sciences or some some other field. But I think unless you wanted to say more about it, I think we can turn to the more fruitful enterprise, as you put it. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I think maybe the only thing that I would say uh, in response to that, which I, I think is a totally fair, fair observation, um, is that as philosophers, we have to be a little bit attentive to when we've successfully farmed something out um, and when it, when it, it really, really ought to remain in our, our domain, right? I mean, it, it doesn't make sense for us to continue asking questions of a sort that we've already contributed to the sort of successful spinning off of, you know, new, new disciplines devoted to, to um, answering just that question using methods that we don't really have access to. Hmm. No, I, I, that makes sense to me as well. Uh, turning though to this, this more fruitful question, as you put it, and understanding that how we answered is going to be totally theory dependent. I think we ought to begin as you do it void with the, the modern classical picture of time and space it, as it began with Newton and his debate with Leibniz. If I am correct in my history here. That was mediated through, was his name Samuel Clark? Yeah, his name was Samuel Clark. Uh, I mean, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The, the direct debate between Newton and Leibniz was mediated through through Clark. Um, the, the, the context in which Newton was developing his views uh, was really in reaction to Descartes um, and was not mediated through Clark, uh, was just sort of kind of, well, I, I should say it was response to Descartes and in some sense in response to Aristotle via um, how Aristotle was read by the, you know, um, Cambridge philosophers in the, the early 17th century. And so, uh, you know, Newton himself is not reacting to Leibniz. Um, Newton's, yeah, Newton's parish priest, Samuel Clark, is kind of defending Newton's views against criticisms from Leibniz. Um, mm -hmm. What I was going to ask was whether their views, though, of course, they were later supplanted in many ways with general relativity and quantum field theory. Did they provide an answer for how to imagine void and the physics of emptiness at the time? But maybe since you just brought in Descartes, it would be a good idea to step back uh, one thinker and just begin with what his views were that Newton was responding to. Yeah. So I, I, I find I, you know, I'm not really a historian of philosophy and I find Descartes views on um, uh, space and time and extension and laws uh, very confused. Um, and I, 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 I'm kind of, hesitant to try to 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 describe them because i think what's going to happen is um i'm i'm both going to um you know do not not do justice to uh the best scholarship on descartes um but but also uh end up sort of going off into to the weeds where i'm not really um particularly well qualified um the the kinds of things though that that newton was reacting to in descartes or things that Newton thought of as uh, confused conceptions of motion and what it meant to define motion. Um, and so, uh, I, I think that, that you know, in, in some sense, Descartes had the, uh, the, the most systematic theory of motion, right? The thing that was supplanted by Newton's three laws um, prior to Newton. Um, and Newton felt that just the basic concepts that were being used in Descartes' laws were not sufficiently precisely defined. Um, and this is, I think, the motivation for Newton to uh, not just state laws of motion, but to... Uh, uh, give a kind of systematic account of what one needed to assume about the structure of space and time in order for motion to make sense 
in the way that he needed it to make sense for the laws to be well posed. Um, and so I'll just I'll just give an example of this. Um, essential to Newton's account is a relationship between force and acceleration. Now, Newton clearly thinks that forces are real physical things. And there's just a fact of the matter about what force is applied to a given body. Now, if it's going to be the case that that, that force is equal to uh, some quantity associated with the body, some quantity of, of, of matter associated with the body times the acceleration of the body, like how much the body accelerates given an impressed force is going to be mediated by this quantity, um, then that acceleration must also be some real physical magnitude. There must be some fact of the matter about how much the body is accelerating. And Newton thinks that in order for there to be some facts of the matter about how much the body is accelerating, there must just be some fact of the matter about where the body is at successive times so that it's, you know, the rate of change of the rate of change of its position over time is a well-defined, meaningful physical quantity independent of observers, independent of, you know, measuring devices or other moving bodies that, you know, relative to which this might be determined. And this is what leads him to this idea that, um, he needs to attribute to space and time enough structure uh, for it to be the case that he can objectively say this body was in this place and then sometime later it's moved to this place. And so there's like some velocity associated with it and that, that velocity can change over time in proportion to the impressed force. Um, and, and I think this is what was missing in pre-Newtonian physics. Descartes was a, a kind of relationist. He thought that there was this, this relationship between uh, body and extension that was ultimately what space was grounded in, but it meant that, that uh, things like location, distance, and stuff like that were all relative to, to other bodies. Um, but that, that clearly isn't enough if you want to say that, that acceleration is a uh, an objective, non-relative fact about the world. Um, and so, you know, n what Newton ends up doing is giving us this picture of, of what space and time uh, have to be like uh, in order for the, his laws of nature to make sense, which then in turn gives us a, a sort of an understanding of what, what empty space would be like, what the world would be like if there wasn't any stuff in it that, that I think diverges pretty radically from the kind of relationist picture that had had occupied you know other enlightenment era physicists um where somehow space is is derivative on on bodies and the relationship between bodies we almost you know the idea of empty space doesn't even make sense hmm. so well just to recapitulate then and, and make explicit how nothing enters the pictures picture in his project to make sure that i'm following totally it was so formulating these assumptions about space and time to make sense of motion in response to Descartes, it was this that brought void and space in the abstract divorced from matter into the picture. And that's how it connects to nothingness in the beginning. Yeah, that's right. So, 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 uh, Newton has to, to, Newton feels he has to say what empty space is like, um, in order to be able to talk about what it means to move through empty space and what it means to, um, uh, have bodies exert forces on one another within space. Um, yeah, so that, that's, that's what I'm claiming. And you said that Descartes was a relationist. Was Leibniz in some sense defending Descartes or just adopting a different relativist picture of space and time? Because I think it's, uh, at least from my outsider perspective, it seems fair to say that the basic dispute between Leibniz and Newton was about whether space in fact constitutes a determinate stage on which the stuff of the world unfolds, so Newton's view, or whether there's no stage at all, but only distances and relationships between the the players on Leibniz's part. Yeah, so so I, I wouldn't say that Leibniz is defending Descartes. I mean, Leibniz had had plenty of problems with Descartes uh, and, and wanted to propose his own physics. Um, it's not like he was somehow a, a Cartesian or a subscriber to, to Descartes' physics. Um, what I would say is that this various forms of relationism were kind of the, the dominant view uh, 
uh, in the period leading up to Newton. And so Leibniz thought that this was kind of um, the the obvious or default position that that it would really require a heavy lift to defend a more absolutist picture of space and time um, for reasons that he gives in the Leibniz Clark correspondence, which which are not you know the kinds of arguments I think that you see Descartes giving, in part because Descartes didn't really have you know. He wasn't responding to an opponent who was arguing for uh, a view like Newton's. Um. And you've already given a good example of Newton's reasoning, but how did Leibniz defend or conceive of this idea of space as being totally relative? I know that he employed some some famous principles in his reasoning, like that of the identity of indiscernibles or sufficient reason. Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, from a modern point of view, uh, it, it's fair to say that what Leibniz is doing is a kind of alchemist reasoning. Um, I mean, basically, he thinks that uh, giving some kind of um, ontological status to space um, that was in, in any way independent of bodies was to allow for ways in which the world could be that couldn't have any kind of observable physical significance. Um, right. And so th this, this means that there's a kind of uh, like extra structure hanging around within your, your picture of the world that, that doesn't seem to be doing anything. Um, and so ultimately the way I see uh, the principle of sufficient reason acting in this context is that when Leibniz is arguing that, you know, God needs to have a reason to make the world one way rather than another, what he's really saying is there's this sort of uh, overabundance of possibilities accorded by your theory. And you can, you can, you know, make that observation by saying, well, how do you choose between them or how does God choose between them? But ultimately what he's saying is, look, there, there's, there's no reason for there to, to, um, you know, you don't need all of these different possibilities. I mean, they, the the distinction between them doesn't play any role in your physics. It doesn't play any observational role. It's not needed for your metaphysics. We should we should try to develop a theory of physics that doesn't require us to posit this kind of um, extraneous looking structure. Mm. So, through some principle of parsimony on Leibniz's picture, absolute space would just seem like, uh, to use your word, an, an extraneous piece of reality. And it would behoove us to try to figure out some better way of making sense of it. Yeah. And now the, the fact is that he was, he was partly right about this, but also partly wrong about this. Um, and one of the, the really fascinating things in the Leibniz Clark correspondence is that, you know, Leibniz gives these very, these very famous arguments. Um, Clark responds by just pointing to the part of the Principia where Newton has already addressed this point. Um, and the issue is Newton argues in the Principia that there are, um, there are physical phenomena that can distinguish, uh, states of absolute rest from states of absolute motion. So motion relative to absolute space, which is basically the thing that Leibniz is claiming you can't do. Um, and these are the famous examples of, you know, the, the, spinning buckets in empty space or, or uh, two balls tethered to one another that are rotating. Um, what, what Leibniz was right about, though, was that uh, Newton's theory doesn't allow you to distinguish states of absolute rest from states of uh, uniform rectilinear motion or even uniform accelerated motion in one direction. Um, and, and, uh, from a, a modern perspective, we can see that there's kind of a sense in which Newton, Newton had a compelling argument. You need to posit a certain amount of structure in order to make sense of the laws, but he was wrong about how much structure you needed to posit. There's a kind of intermediate answer in between the kind of, uh, minimalist picture that Leibniz seemed to be defending and the, I don't want to say maximalist picture, but the, the, the more generous picture that Newton was defending, um, where, uh, you know, you can sort of see Leibniz having a point 
um, even though the kind of reasoning that that Newton is employing um, is is compelling and you can't go as far as Leibniz wanted to go. Hmm. You said that Leibniz was partly right and partly wrong. And of course, I mean, further development in physics would really change things and the jury's still out. But historically speaking, around this time, was there a consensus among physicists and philosophers about whose picture was correct? Or was it just totally a mixed bag? Uh, no, I would say that there was not in any way a consensus. Uh, so, I mean, there, there are a few different things going on here. Um, one is that I think that if you, if you really dig down into Newton's thought and Leibniz's thought, uh, the differences between them are much less than they're normally made out to be. And so people often discuss, you know, a substantivalist relationist debate. Um, just what we mean by substantivalism here is, is, I think, quite complicated. But one thing that Newton is absolutely clear about is that he does not think space is a substance. Um, I think the best account of Newton's view of space is a kind of structuralist one. You know, he has these arguments that if you, the arguments are specifically about time, but it, it's clear that he thinks that they apply to space as well. That if you if you take two instants and you swap them with one another, you don't end up with a new possibility. Because what makes an instant an instant is its position in a linear ordering of instants. Right. And so it, it has something to do with the structural relationships between points in time or, or, or places in space that, that make space the way that it is and makes, you know, get, gives those, those entities, um, uh, whatever identity that they have. Um, and I think one thing that we've learned in the 20th century and the 21st century is that that kind of idea is actually quite closely related to ideas about space being whatever it is that you need to make sense of all of the possible ways in which matter could be configured. And this, again, is is ultimately, I think, the best reading of Leibniz, that he's, he's a relationist in a strongly modal sense. He thinks it's not just that space consists of the actual relations between actual bodies, but that it's it's a way of, of uh, um, characterizing the possible relationships between possible bodies. And so, you know, both of these end up being kind of structuralist ideas, I think, and and you can find quite a lot of similarity between them. Of course, it, it, it ends up requiring uh, mathematical ideas that they didn't have access to. Um, uh, the way that the, the debate was conceived at the time, though, um, was, I think, muddied by a number of different issues, some of which had to do with the way Clark expressed himself in the letter, himself in the letter, some of which had to do with uh, the the role that Leibniz's metaphysics played on the continent, some of which had to do with um, political disputes. I mean, so Le Leibniz and Newton, um, I mean, the reason they ended up in these priority disputes in the first place had a lot to do with the fact that the Hanoverian government uh, left Leibniz behind when they went to become the, the, the monarchs of England. And Leibniz was trying to get back in the good graces uh, of um, King George the uh, First, and so um, he was trying to like prove that 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 Newton's stuff was somehow problematic. Um, but you know, the, the end result of all of this was that uh, there was you know just a, a kind of a, a, a breakdown in communication in both math and physics between the United Kingdom and continental Europe for um, close to a century after Leibniz died. And you see the sort of continued development within the United Kingdom of, well, it wasn't the United Kingdom yet, it was just Great Britain in 1701. Um, you, you see this development within Great Britain of uh, essentially Newtonian ideas without a lot of, of um, acceptance of critiques from, you know, Leibniz and, and uh, his followers. And then you see sort of a, you know, continued development of, Leibnizian metaphysics with, with increasing increasing sensitivity to the fact that actually Newtonian physics is is pretty successful, um, but ultimately poorly grounded uh, metaphysically happening on the continent. And so you can see this, for instance, in Du Chatelet's work, where she's 
uh, trying to square Newtonian physics with Leibnizian metaphysics. She's not really not taking seriously Newton's own views on space and time. She's trying to show how Newton's physics could be compatible with something that's broadly Leibnizian or actually Wolfian. Um, you see people on the continent who are defending Newton, like Euler is a, a kind of strong absolutist in the uh, the 18th century. Um, but uh, in some ways, is kind of less sophisticated metaphysically, I think, than Newton ends up being. And so I, I would say it's almost an ironic situation where I think if, if Newton and Leibniz could get rid of their political squabbles and uh, get rid of the personality conflicts um, and had access to 20th and 21st century mathematics, they would find that they had a lot of common ground and that Leibniz had a legitimate critique of Newton. But Newton had a legitimate defense against the view that Leibniz was trying to push. But you don't see, after Newton and Leibniz, in my view, you don't see convergence towards that for centuries. What you see is actually divergence where uh, uh, people are trying to defend the more extreme versions of Newton and Leibniz's views, almost caricatures of their views, um, uh, in their role as followers of these, these figures. Hmm. So it was a very, very consequential debate. I mean, obviously, we're still talking about it today. But uh, just to sum up and restricting ourselves to their views, not really worrying about the present yet, is the upshot concerning void on Leibniz's interpretation of physics that were there no things, there would be no space. And then on Newton's view, there would still be this empty stage, stage so to speak, though, as you put it, it would... It would be structure rather than a substance of course. So the, the image of a stage with wood and stuff is a bit misleading. Uh, and, but the, but the stage, the structure, it would be such that there would really be nothing to distinguish any portion of it from any other. That's right. Now, I, I think, I think Leibniz's view is probably more complicated than what you just said, because Leibniz thought a few other things. He, he was a plenist. He thought again, using kind of principle of sufficient reason. Uh, type arguments um, in connection with his view that uh, this was the best of all possible worlds and that more stuff was always better than less stuff. He thought that that God would necessarily have chosen to put something everywhere. And so there are other reasons why there couldn't be empty space having to do with, uh, uh, you know, the nature of, of God. Um, it's kind of hard to think about the question, okay, but what if we relax that constraint and said, what would the, would the world have been like had God not chosen as God must have chosen? Um, and here, I think that actually the, the modal relationism can come in where you say, well, space would still be the, the, um, that thing that encodes the possible relations between all possible bodies. Um, but this ends up being a very thin notion of, of space. And it's not really clear that uh, if there truly were no bodies, but could have been bodies, um, which is what you would need to, to uh, uh, be thinking about here. Um, uh, that, um, you would really want to say that, that this encoding of possible relations between things, uh, should count as, as having any kind of ontological status at all. I mean, it, it um, just, yeah, it seems, seems very thin. Uh, I don't talk about, I don't talk about Leibniz's views so much in, in, in the book here. I sort of focus on, on, um, Newton and the sense of empty space that we're getting within Newtonian physics. Um, but my, my sense is that it's actually much more subtle to say uh, what kinds of views Leibniz could have had about um, what empty space would be like. Well, be before we move into general relativity and how it might inform our view of empty space. I think it would be worth rehashing just how the theory altered our conception 
from the classical picture. For our listeners who aren't familiar with Einstein's work, is there a, an easy way to describe the shift in space-time from the Euclidean absolute image of Newton's to one that's relative, that doesn't allow for absolute simultaneity and so on? And we don't have to be comprehensive at all because these issues have come up on the past in the show. Yeah, I, so so Einstein's work on space and time happened in two stages. Uh, the first one was really driven by foundational problems in Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism, having to do with precisely the kinds of things that Leibniz was worried about. So Leibniz is worried about uh, the um, physical significance of absolute rest and... Uh, what role determinations of absolute motion can play in Newtonian physics. Maxwell, on his own conception of the theory, of, of his theory can be seen as, as um, sort of uh, relying on a Newtonian concept of absolute rest. Um, I mean, he's doing this by introducing a, uh, a substance that the ether, the luminiferous ether, the, the, the material through which light is, is supposed to be moving. Um, and supposing that that's at rest, or at least is providing a standard of rest. Um, but what what people realize over the course of the the late nineteenth century was that this state of rest, this luminiferous ether, whatever its its state of motion was, was um, not playing any observable role in electromagnetic phenomena. And this led to to some kind of deep puzzlement. Because it seemed as if the theory required this, um, but it also seemed as if the theory needed to be sort of our theory of matter needed to be like carefully tuned, almost gerrymandered to look like, um, you know, have these like kind of conspiratorial uh, features such that we could not measure motion relative to this uh, absolute state of rest associated with the ether. And so Einstein's idea is to, to sort of really go back to the, the basics and say, we can get rid of this presupposition about the, the state of, you know, this absolute state of rest and, and this ether, um, by reconfiguring how we think about space and time. Um, and what this ends up doing, uh, is, um, in the first step, just sort of changing definitions about what length means, what duration means, what angles are, making all of those quantities relative to different states of motion. So different observers and different states of motion, different measuring instruments and different states of motion are going to make different determinations of these quantities. The definitions of the quantities end up being uh, relativized to idealized measuring apparatuses. Um, if you redefine things in this way, the conspiratorial element goes away. You no longer need it to be the case that, uh, you know, electrons are, are um, uh, you know, undergoing some complicated internal dynamics in order to make it impossible for us to measure uh, the, the behavior of the ether. What's happening is that um, our, our conception of space and time uh, is just different than we thought it was. What we mean by length is changing. Now, that happens in 1905. Um, shortly thereafter, it's recognized that, that by, by Herman Minkowski, uh, it's recognized that you can reconceive all of this in a, a very nice geometric way. Um, where, you know, you can think of, Newto of Newtonian space time as attributing a certain geometrical structure to the, the totality of events in space and time. You can see Einstein is just attributing a different, in many ways closely related, but distinct structure to the totality of events in space and time. Um, but again, the basic thing is we're encoding information about lengths and durations. The final step comes, you know, between 1913 and 1915, where Einstein is trying to figure out how to take this, you know, very beautiful new geometric picture uh, that makes sense of electromagnetism 
and fit in Newtonian gravitation, right? Because the beginning of the 19th century, or the beginning of the 20th century, rather, we have these two theories. We have Newton's theory of gravitation, which is still doing a great job uh, in, in virtually all of our applications. In fact, we have hundreds of years of precision tests of Newtonian gravitation. This is as well established as any theory could have been at that time. Um, but then we also have Maxwell's theory. And Einstein has argued that Maxwell's theory requires this radical reconceptualization of space and time. But Newton's theory doesn't fit with his new conceptualization of space and time. And so you have this kind of tension, right? You know, is it is it the space time that Maxwell's theory seems to need or the space time that Newton's theory seems to need? Um, and so Einstein's idea is that we should reformulate gravity in a way that's compatible with relativity. And this is what ultimately leads to this idea that um, gravity actually isn't a force at all. Gravity is a manifestation of the space-time structure. And that the way in which you get all of the, the degrees of freedom you need to describe gravitational interactions is that um, space and time have themselves additional degrees of freedom, uh, that space and time can be curved. And what we mean by space and time here is still, once again, um, the sort of uh, uh, encoding of the, the kind of measurement apparatuses, like the things that measurements measurements can be made. Now, subsequently, we came to think of things in a, a, a much more geometrical way where it's kind of these operational definitions in some sense fall fall away or, or come to have the status of interpretational principles uh, or interpretive principles. Um, but at least I think the way that Einstein was thinking about it, uh, that, that kind of operationalistic picture was still um, very important to him as he was understanding what it meant for space and time to be curved. Uh, in 1915. Was that... You said that one major consequence of the shift from Newton's view of space, among other major consequences, is how we conceive of length, and then perhaps by extension, no pun, no pun intended, uh, distance. And in the classical picture, I mean, it's quite easy to make sense of distances and relations in space because we know how to do this in a three-dimensional or four-dimensional Euclidean space. But maybe to wrap our heads around space in Minkowski, who you mentioned, Minkowski space-time or Schwarzschild space-time, how do we even measure distances to pick out or describe intervals or volumes of space in the first place? Yeah. So, I mean, let, let's just start with special relativity. Um, I mean, the, the picture that emerges is one in which, so it, for, in, for Newtonian physics, um, there's, there's a fact of the matter about the spatial distance between any two simultaneous locations, any two simultaneous events. Um, and there's a fact about the temporal distance, like the amount of time between any two non-simultaneous events. Newton thought there was also a fact of the matter about the spatial distance between two non-simultaneous events. And this is ultimately whether there's a fact of the matter about that question is the thing that um, uh, is at issue in the like 20th century resolutions of the Newton-Leibniz debate. Um, in, in relativity, ultimately what you want to say is that you simply don't have those kinds of relationships. The relationships you have are spatiotemporal distances between events. And given any two events, there's a fact of the matter about the spatiotemporal relationship between them. There's some number you can assign. There's a, a metric that measures the distance between any two events in space and time. Uh, the thing is that when we talk about lengths, we aren't talking about space-time distance. We're talking about spatial distance. And so what we end up meaning by length in ordinary conversation, I mean, in a lot of physics too, but in ordinary conversation is something that we have to kind of reconstruct within relativity theory as the sorts of things that someone who is trying to make certain kinds of measurements while themselves moving through space and time uh, would end up doing and saying. And so measurements of length end up being a kind of derived notion, um, derived as like 
the projection of the space time distance between two events, uh, or, or the space time distance really between two trajectories representing, you know, say, particles undergoing different states of motion or the edges of a, a, a ruler or something like that over time. Um, the projection of that information uh, onto something that that observer thinks of as space at a time. Um, does that make some sense or is that helpful? I, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, very, very much sensible and helpful. One peculiarity about all of this that I wanted to make sure that I asked you about was not about Minkowski space time, but Schwarzschild space time. And how how is it that it results in situations where two regions of space are no longer even connected or rather, I, I mean, we might think of it as there being no distance between them as measured by the time it would take uh, light to pass from one region to another. Yeah. So, I mean, this is, this is, um, this is how we represent black holes, right? I mean, we, we're, there's, you know, I, I think, I think it's, 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 pretty common i mean both among astrophysicists and and among people who aren't like you know neck deep in general relativity to think of black holes as like you know compact objects just out in the world you know kind of like stars but just kind of denser um but given the the relationship between uh gravity and space and time and general relativity you end up with a situation where um what what's distinctive about the interior region of a black hole is that there are no paths that light or any massive body could travel to get from the interior of a black hole to the exterior of the black hole. There's just there's there's no trajectory you can follow that would would take you from that place to that place. Now, time in general relativity isn't absolute, right? You give me two events. It's not the case that I can say how long, like what the duration is between them. What I can do is if they're related by the kind of path that a massive particle could follow, I could say how long that particle would uh, think it took to get from the first point to the second point along whatever path it traveled. And so, you know, um, what I can do is I can I can say uh you know like <laughs> i'm trying to think of i'm trying to think of an example of like a some some specific historical event and the thing that's coming to mind is like the 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 magic bullet from dallas in 1963 that killed kennedy okay but like that thing has followed some trajectory to where it is now and what general relativity can tell you is uh how much time that has measured but is it you know it's measuring it along a particular path through space and time. And if it had taken a different path through space and time, it would have measured something else. Okay, so now coming back to Schwarzschild space time, the key thing is what we mean by duration is only relative to the sorts of paths that massive bodies can follow. But the interior of a black hole is such that there is no path out. There's no way to get out of it. So there's no path that can take you that like a along which this kind of measurement could be made. Which ends up having the 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 consequence that regions in the ex like the exterior regions of black holes, like places outside of black holes, are are not before or after. Or there are some that are before, I guess, but th there aren't there aren't like locations outside of the black hole that are you know after any region inside the black hole. You get this kind of radical disconnection between the interior of the black hole and the stuff the stuff outside for this reason. Now, Newton's view of space seemed to provide a much more intuitive picture of what nothing, or before I say much more, it, it provides a very intuitive picture, I think, of what, of how we should think of space when there are no objects in it. But it's not as easy for me to do the same with these revolutions that came from Einstein, particularly because in the, like, for instance, in the example we just gave with black holes, it is a massive object that gives space these distortions and very salient properties. So how 
Is it just that we have to think that there must be this pre-existing uh, or object independent uh, geometry to space without objects that these massive objects warp or that light travels along? This is how we should think of space in the absence of anything? So first on the, the intuitive picture, I mean, I, there's something I, 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 I completely agree with you, of course. Um, but I, I think that there's a kind of historical accident here because Newton's views, I mean, Newton's views were considered extremely counterintuitive, right? Leibniz was defending the default view. Descartes and all of these other philosophers, um, you know, in, in the 15th and 16th century, uh, would have endorsed, you know, relationist type views. Um, and so there's something, something kind of odd about saying, well, but Newton's views are so intuitive to us. Like, they really weren't intuitive at the time. I mean, they're intuitive now, maybe for reasons having to do with, like, enculturation and, and, and custom and stuff like that. Like, you know, we're taught to think about space and time in largely Newtonian terms. Our first introduction to physics is invariably through Newton. Um, you know, if when you're a little kid, your parents don't tell you, oh, like, when you drop that, it's going to fall because of gravity. They tell you instead, um, uh, when you drop that, it's going to collide with the earth because you're no longer exerting a force to keep it up. You know, maybe you'd end up having different like ideas about space and time. I don't know. Um, I'm not trying this experiment with my kids for what it's worth. Um, so I, I, I think the thing to say about, uh, it seems to me like what, what you're worried about with relativity um, is how to think about these situations where you have curved space time, but no matter. Um, are we in some kind of like weird modal space where we're considering situations where matter is curving space time, but we've imagined the matter isn't there. And so now we're in some kind of like, you know, counter counter nomological like like non law governed situation or something like that and 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 that's not actually what what is happening here the thing is that general relativity like einstein's equation the fundamental equation of general relativity the equivalent of newton's um i mean kind of the equivalent of newton's law of universal gravitation uh allows for solutions in which there is no matter but space and time are curved. I don't think this is exactly the right way of thinking about it, but one one uh, idea that physicists sometimes have is that um, because this theory is non-linear, there's a sense in which the curvature of space-time reacts to itself. And so there's a kind of like space-time being curved leads to curvature of space-time, right? And so you end up with this kind of self-consistent totality. Um, but where you don't need an entity that's causing it to curve, uh, it's sufficient to have curvature that that you just have a kind of a, a global solution in which curvature is, is present. Um, you don't even have to think of it in terms of global solutions, actually. You can give me some initial data. So specify the world at a time and suppose that, that in that world, there's a little bit of curvature. There will continue to be curvature. It will evolve over time in such a way that that, that curvature is going to you know, have other effects on the curvature of space time. Um, I mean, maybe the most intuitive cases, I mean, so, so black holes are a weird case because we want to think of black holes as things they are the remnants of collapsed stars, stuff like that. But general relativity allows for a possibility where there was never a star in the first place. You just have, you know, globally, uh, infinite, you know, like it, from like T equals negative infinity to T equals infinity a black hole present with no matter anywhere ever existing. Right. And, and, you know, if you imagined what it would be like to be, you know, a little speck of dust in this otherwise empty universe, you would gravitate towards this thing. You would approach it as if it were a planet or something like that, but there's no stuff there. There's just the curvature. Right. Right. Um, but I, I mean, I think the most intuitive kinds of cases are to think about gravitational waves. Um, right. And so, so think about a situation where you have like, you know, well, so, I mean, as a, as a first step, think about like an incandescent light bulb, 
where you have some current running through uh, um, a resistor. The resistor is getting hot and it's releasing photons. And then the photons are sort of propagating away from that, you know, excited um, object. Uh, now imagine a situation where instead of running a current through a wire, uh, you have like, you know, a binary star system and these things are, are orbiting each other. But they're orbiting each other in, in some sort of way that ends up producing something analogous to uh, uh, electromagnetic radiation. And, and just like the electromagnetic radiation will sort of travel away and then, you know, eventually hit your retina, these gravitational waves will travel away from that rotating body. But as they're traveling away, they're in a region where there's no matter, right? So, I mean, you've got these two things that are going around each other. They're, they're sort of emitting this gravitational radiation, but far away from them, it's just the radiation, the gravitational radiation, which is all curvature, propagating under its own speed or under its own momentum, I guess. Um, now, we can detect those, you know, many, many, many light years away. Um, but so you can imagine a situation now where uh, you're in that region of empty space and all you have is the gravitational radiation, sort of the relic from this uh, uh, this binary star system far away from you, um, introducing curvature, like dynamically moving, introducing curvature like over time through through this region of, of space where there isn't any stuff. Now, the final step is to say, well, now imagine that the universe just consisted of that empty region. You, you just have, you know, curvature undergoing some kind of dynamics as described by Einstein's equation uh, in a wave-like state without any matter present at all. Yeah. Well, before we finish with a bit about quantum field theory, here is more of what I, or here's what I think of as m more squarely a bona fide philosophical question. Does this picture of space in general relativity, where space has its own geometry that warps and ripples with gravitational waves or with black holes, does it strike you at all as something uh, bordering on platonic in the sense that it gives an existence to mathematical objects. Maybe, I mean, one response is that if it's causally efficacious, it's not platonic and is, I mean, just definitively physical. Yeah. I mean, I, I think like, I mean, just consider like how easy it would be to solve the Nasser-S problem if you could set up two mirrors uh, uh, a certain distance away from one another and then detect the number two in the wobble between the two mirrors, right? I mean, like... Um, yeah, I, 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 I think, I think, um, there are lots of things that you can say about, uh, the relationship between mathematics and physics and the sense in which math is, um, the, the sense in which we're taking mathematical structure and attributing it to the world and what that means. Um, but ultimately what general relativity is telling us is that the physical world behaves in certain ways and, that stuff is is causally efficacious, such as you say. I mean, it results from other kinds of of uh, physical processes, and it influences other kinds of physical processes. Let's move on to quantum field theory. And before we get into it, do you have another? I mean, you did a great job with uh, special and general relativity, but do you have a simple way of explaining the? the major shift in how one has to view the world when moving from a, a classical to a quantum picture and why this is so, and I'll put a, a, well, I don't know if this is a pun, why it's so jarring. Um, yeah, well, so from my point of view, you know, we understand general relativity and we don't understand quantum mechanics or quantum field theory. Uh, and so there are lots of things that people can say. And obviously, you know, we've been doing this for well over a century now and, and we've had successive generations. We've had like, you know, knowledge transmission and uh, elaboration and so on. It's so like, you know, clearly the sense in which we don't understand these theories is a pretty nuanced one. Um, but uh, nonetheless, I think that that we really don't have the final word on what the right conceptual framework for thinking about quantum theory is. Um, and so uh, I feel 
uh, a little bit less confident here. Uh, but the <laughs> basic idea, I mean, quantum mechanics in its early history went through sort of a series of pretty dramatic revolutions. Um, there were really big conceptual changes that happened around the turn of the 20th century that were then elaborated for a while. And then there were, I would say, equally big conceptual changes that happened in the 1920s. Um, and then you might say that there were equally big conceptual changes that happened in the late 1940s and early 1950s um, with the advent of quantum field theory. Um, and so it's it's not, not so simple as uh, a kind of, you know, 10 year period where uh, one problem is solved, it introduces another problem, and then that second problem is solved, and now we have a theory. Um, it's more like uh, a lot of a lot of um, uh, sort of gradual progress, big conceptual changes, gradual progress, big conceptual changes, and then situations where we're kind of aware that we don't really understand what's going on, but we also have figured out how to work with the theory and can design experiments and those experiments are doing, you know, are, are really well described by the theory, and um, we're pretty happy with where we've ended up. Uh, so, I think maybe the 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 place to put um, sort of focus attention here is the way in which quantum mechanics forces us to change our understanding of what a property is. Or like what a maybe you should say like what a, a physical magnitude is or what a quantity is in physics, um, but I mean, physical magnitudes are 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 uh, characterizations of the properties that we attribute to matter. So I, this is I mean in some sense just different words for the same the same thing. Um, in sort of standard physics, these these are called observables. Um, it's not really the right language for reasons that John Bell emphasized. Um, because we're actually not talking about what we can observe. We're talking about what the world is like. Yeah, exactly. So it's, you know, he, he recommended beable, um, but no one uses that. And so I'm not going to, I will say observable, but with the um, caveat that what we're talking about are, you know, um, the, the, the ways in which things can be. Um, so what happened in the 1920s was that uh, two different lines of thought converged in the realization that the way in which we think about the properties of matter had to change. And it had to change in two ways. One of the ways in which it had to change was that it was no longer the case that we could just take for granted that all quantities could take on any value at all. And so what do I mean by that? I mean, in classical physics, like there are basically two possibilities, right? Like um, you can have things that have to be positive or you can have things that uh, can take any value from negative infinity to infinity. But like the things that are positive, you know, they're just continuous. Like it, it doesn't, you know, you can, you can have any value for energy. You can have any value for momentum. You can have any value for entropy, whatever um, position you know, these, these sorts of determinables associated with, uh, with matter, uh, are, are always simply structured in this, uh, and always in the same way, or just any possible, any, any numerically possible value is physically possible. Um, that turned out not to be correct. Um, and, uh, that was one of the things that people first realized at the turn of the 20th century was that energy states, uh, like the, the amount of energy associated with configurations of matter, like in, in atoms, um, were discrete. It, it wasn't the case that, uh, that, that an electron orbiting, um, the nucleus of an atom, say, uh, could have any orbital energy at all or could con continuously vary in its orbital energy the way that, say, um, Mars, right? Like, like the orbit of Mars could gradually shift outwards or gradually shift inward, occupying each each position in between, 
Um, electrons aren't like that. They can't gradually shift outwards and gradually shift inwards. And so far as you can think of them as orbiting at all, they're discrete orbital levels with discreetly different energy. And they jump from one to the other. They jump from one to the other precisely when they are um, uh, either um, basically hit with or emit a photon of precisely that discrete difference between the, the energy levels. Okay, and so that's like a really radical change in what it means for uh, matter to have properties that like they come in these discrete bundles, right? And that, that's the origin of the word quantum. The quantum is supposed to correspond to this like discreteness associated with um, uh, properties like orbital energy. Um, the second big conceptual change having to do with how we conceive of properties that happened in the 1920s was it was it was discovered that they were um I'll, I'll say in the mathematical terms non-commutative in a certain way order matters um and you can think of this in terms of, of measurement if you'd like um if you measure momentum first and then measure position the, the probabilities associated with the outcomes of your position measurement will be different from if you started with the exact same system, made the exact same measurements, but switched the order and measured the position first and then measured the momentum second. So something about measuring one quantity fundamentally changes, necessarily changes the statistical distribution of the possible outcomes of other measurements that you can make. Um, now that like this basic fact about non-commutativity, about order mattering in, in measurements or in interactions or in, you know, any kind of way of determining properties, um, ends up having a whole bunch of consequences. Uh, maybe the most famous is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So the Heisenberg uncertainty principle says that the, the more precisely, you know, the position of something the less precisely you can know its momentum and vice versa. There's version for energy and time. This is just a manifestation of that order mattering thing that I've just described. And the way to think about it is, um, uh, if I have a perfectly precise measurement of position, my uncertainty about what my next measurement is going to be for momentum uh, becomes sort of maximal. And so in some sense, by making that first measurement, I've now changed my expected statistics for the second measurement. Um, and the exact opposite would happen if I had a perfectly precise measurement of momentum to begin with. Um, and so what this ends up meaning is that we just need to, to completely change the, the way in which we conceive of, represent mathematically, manipulate um, properties as we assign them to bodies in the microscopic world. Um, and that ends up having a whole bunch of downstream consequences for how we set up our conception of sort of the, the whole possibility space of physics. Like what kinds of configurations there are, well, what kinds of configurations there are going to be determined by uh, the different ways in which things could be. The different ways in which things could be, we've just learned have this radically new structure having um, you know, these, these, uh, order effects and these sort of discrete, um, uh, values. Um, and what this ends up meaning is that, uh, um, yeah, I mean, we, we, we end up having a new conception of, of, uh, what the space of, of possible ways in which the world could be, um, following, you know, 1930 approximately. And of course it, it's very well known that quantum field theory and general relativity haven't been unified, but one of the big issues is that while in general relativity, space is smooth and continuous, even if it is um, rippling and, and warped, uh, quantum field theory tells us that at, at, at very short scales, it is jittering violently. Uh, but I, I, that's not the direction in which I want to go with our our time remaining. Uh, but so with the understanding that we're we're skipping over a lot of important material, I already mentioned your uh, beautiful introduction of Dirac in our <laughs> yeah, introduction. Yeah, I, I want to go but, back and 
read that now. I, that was very flattering. I like that. It was, <laughs> I'd like to see yeah, what no, I no, said. You, you <laughs> it was quite nice. Uh, but so what was his theory of quantum electrodynamics? And of course, that, that's a huge question. But I think what's significant for us here is the role that fields play in the theory and how it maybe changes our view of, of particles. Yeah. So, so um, this is part of like a real kind of lurching towards a new theory. Um, so one of the things, you know, just like how, you know, right after Einstein introduced special relativity, uh, there was this kind of elephant in the room, which was, okay, you solved these problems for electrodynamics, but you've done it by breaking gravity. Um, it was very clear in the early 1930s, right? Once we have this kind of second revolution in quantum mechanics coming to a, its its uh, conclusion that, um, okay, great. You've got a new theory. It's really mathematically beautiful. We understand a whole lot about the quantum world that we didn't understand before, um, but it's flatly inconsistent with relativity theory. And so, uh, something needs to give we either need to come up with a relativistic quantum mechanics or um, we need to figure out some new way of solving the problems with electromagnetism, one that's compatible now with general relativity, which we have quite a bit of evidence for already, um, that is is going to, to be compatible with the structure of space and time as understood in quantum mechanics. Um, and so, one of the first ways of doing this uh, was proposed by, by Dirac. Um, and, and Dirac's idea was that the, the kind of conflict between relativity and uh, quantum mechanics had to do with the uh, fundamental equation of quantum mechanics, basically the Schrodinger equation, um, being a sort of set in Newtonian space-time, roughly speaking. Um, it sort of presupposes a, a, a standard of simultaneity and a... a um, not exactly a standard of rest, um, but uh, uh, definitely simultaneity, and so kind of a like a preferred state of motion from a relativistic point of view. And so Dirac's idea is: well, if we could could introduce a modification of the Schrodinger equation that's compatible with relativity, then uh, we'll have a quantum theory that ends up being um, compatible with uh, relativity theory. Um, and this isn't exactly how things turn out. Um, the the way in which uh, we've come to understand Dirac's equation um, is not so much as an analog to the Schrodinger equation, but as a description of a new kind of entity, um, which itself has a quantum theory associated with it. And this new kind of entity is a quantum field. Okay, and so what what a you know a field is is basically a, an entity that sort of extends throughout all of space, um, and can be described by assignments of different property values to different places. Classically, we can think of it as numbers associated with points in space and time. Um, a quantum field is similar in some regards. It's it's similar in the sense that it's it's distributed throughout all of space and time. Um, it, it undergoes, uh, dynamics that, that sort of locally depend on, you know, so like what will happen a little bit later in one place is going to depend on how it's arranged nearby. Um, and so it's not like, you know, causally dependent on its distant regions typically. Uh, but it doesn't, in, I mean, th these properties that we're talking about that, you know, previously we could think of as numbers associated with points, uh, have to have all of the quantum structure right and so the the field values don't commute with one another the field values in general can take discrete values um, for quantum fields so many many actually don't you can have properties that don't take discrete uh, values but but that's a possibility that needs to be accommodated by the theory um, and so what Dirac's equation ends up doing is describing the all those pre-quantum dynamics of this new kind of entity that it turns out describes electrons very well and describes quarks very well, describes the whole class of, of um, objects that we call fermions uh, very well. Um, I mean, his original understanding of what he was doing turned out to be kind of wrong, um, but 
the the equation that he he wrote down um, turned out to be extremely fruitful, and you eventually ended up with a, a theory of electrons, which is what he was trying to describe in the first place. That was in fact described by his equation. It just required some conceptual reconfiguring. Hmm. Well, now putting all of this together, how does quantum field theory relate to nothingness? I mean, through the void. And then I think the crucial idea here is one, the the quantum vacuum state and then the the fluctuations that occur. There. Yeah. So, so the, the, the first thing to say is that, um, you know, when you reconceive of, of, uh, what kinds of properties things can have, like how things can be configured, you end up having a kind of a new theory of, um, yeah, just like the modal space, like the the, the ways in which physical stuff can be arranged. Um, now, we're now thinking, like we say, okay, well, so that that's the space of, of possible physical, physical configurations. Um, how would we think about one of those possible configurations as being one in which there isn't any stuff present like is is you know is emptiness or is nothingness described as a physical state just like any other physical state by this theory now that we have a new theory of what the physical states are um and the answer turns out to be yes the way in which people have sort of come to to think about this is by saying well um once we think of matter as a distributed thing the way that that quantum fields force us to um, we should be able to ask questions like, uh, well, is the configuration of this quantum field one in which if I were to perform an experiment to detect how many particle-like excitations there were in the world, I would be confident that there were none. Like, is, is there a, a possible state in which were I to measure all of the particles in the world, I would definitely get the answer zero. And the answer is yes. This is and this is the state that 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 um, gets called the vacuum state. It's the it's the lowest energy state in the theory. It's a, a state in which um, the the theory predicts that globally there are no particles. And by there are no particles, I'm, I'm what I mean is you know there's a property in this space of possible properties described by quantum mechanics, which is the property how many particles are there in the universe at a time, and that state is such that that property has the value zero. Um, it's just like all of these other consequent, like all of this other structure that we have in the theory ends up meaning that that statement, which seems like a perfectly natural way of capturing the idea that you have empty space, does not have the consequences that you'd expect. Right? So one consequence you might expect is that if you're certain that there will be no particles globally, if you measure the entire universe at a time, that it will follow that there will be any particles if you measure them locally. Like if you go in your backyard and you put a particle detector, will you, will you, find anything. And the answer is just like that consequence doesn't hold. It just doesn't follow from there being no particles globally that there are no particles locally. There can be particles locally. Um, now, I think the basic mathematical fact is what I've just described. Now the question is like, how could we possibly conceive of a breakdown of such a, a simple and obvious inference? And the way the physicists do this, which is in some ways metaphorical, is to say, well, there's this kind of, this kind of, uh, uh, these like possibilities of little excitations, like, like it's like a roiling sea of stuff. And every so often something will pop up and then go back down. Um, and somehow, somehow when we're talking about the global measurement, we're thinking about a, a, a kind of an average measurement over the whole universe, but somehow locally still, you can have these little excitations that that could end up having um, uh, consequences in, in in certain kinds of measurements. Um, now, I mean, I should pause and say, like you were asking these questions about like the weird modal structure of emptiness and, and relativity. I, you definitely get weird modal questions in this context, right? Because what we're asking about is what would be measured in empty space. But of course, in empty space, you don't have measuring instruments. And if you did have measuring instruments, you wouldn't be in empty space any longer. And it's really unclear what we're talking about. Um, you know, conceptually, the right way of thinking about it is you have these, these quantities, uh, these things that we call observables. Those observables 
in cases where we are making measurements, have an interpretation in terms of what the possible outcomes and the statistics for those possible outcomes and measurements would be. Here, what we're doing is saying, well, we can't, we can't actually perform those measurements, but we have a standard toolbox for talking about what the significance of uh, certain states giving certain values for certain observables um, is. And so, uh, uh, that's what I've like, that's what's going on here. Like we're saying, you know, like our local number operators, our local number observables will have non-zero expectation values in regions where, uh, you know, e e even though globally the number operator is, um, in a state that, that is, uh, uh identically associated with zero particles. Um, and uh, the rest is kind of colorful metaphor. I'd say. Well, uh, Jim, the last thing I'll have, I think will hopefully be a quick, maybe yes or no question before we say goodbye is granted that quantum field theory and general relativity are two of our most successful theories. I think quantum field theory has been confirmed to something like 14 decimal points. Are you then of the opinion that going forward, any successor theory in any successor, any successor theory will leave no room for this perfect sort of void as we envision it with nothing in it. Because either way, I mean, like string theory, for instance, is fundamentally quantum mechanical. Uh, but we also know that general relativity, on the other hand, has this rich geometrical background to space. Is there any room for, for a very simple picture of a void or is that just totally out? Yeah, I think that's toast. I mean, uh, it's, it's ironic, but, you know, in, in string theory, you end up, in a lot of quantum gravity, actually, you end up... Um, uh, thinking of gravity not as a force exactly, but as mediated by particles the way that forces are mediated by particles. Um, and so you have these gravitons that are kind of like photons. Uh, and so th there is a possibility, I think, that we're going to end up wanting to say that some of these richly structured empty space-time solutions in general relativity uh, should actually be thought of as sort of filled with gravitons, which are kind of like objects in the way that photons are kind of like objects. Um, and so, you know, it's, 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 uh, plausible that some of the, the sort of rich conceptual structure of empty space is going to get left behind. Um, but any view that looks like that or any theory that looks like that is going to be one in which, uh, you're going to have a gravitational vacuum like, you have in quantum field theory and you're going to have gravitons, you know, spontaneously popping in and out of existence locally. And so locally, you're still going to have something that's going to end up looking like manifestations of curvature, even though globally you're in flat space time. Well, Jim, thank you so much. This has been a whirlwind tour through the physics of nothingness. Yeah. Thanks Robinson. Hold on. If you haven't subscribed, liked, commented, or reviewed, that would be so helpful. And if you haven't yet, you could also follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Robinson Earhart.